The other concept that I thought was very interesting from the O'Connor reading was the concept of language panics, which originally comes from the linguistic anthropologist Jane Hill. The idea of times in societies where there is a moment of fear, uncertainty, panic about something to do, ultimately in one way or another, with language. O'Connor uses the example of uh, Spanish and English in Major League Baseball and talks about, for example, one sports commentator who later had to issue a formal apology, um, but one sports commentator who remarked that one originally Spanish-speaking uh, baseball player needed to learn, quote, the language of baseball to communicate with his team, the language of baseball there, of course, in his equation being English. And so, despite the very large number of Spanish-speaking members of professional baseball in the United States. And so this is an example of language panic. And as is brought up in the article by O'Connor, and I think O'Connor makes a convincing point, language in cases like that is kind of becoming a proxy for not just language. Instead, people are using language and the ways in which, oh, well, these people won't be able to talk to each other, or they need to learn the original language of baseball or whatever, these kind of comments about language are being used to talk about other sorts of things that are you're not necessarily supposed to comment on as overtly, namely cultural and racial shifts going on within baseball. <laughs> and so, for example, uh, the sort of outcry and pushback um, against the quote-unquote antics, as they were sometimes called in the media, um, or as we might say, just um, responses, because I think antics is a put down. Uh, but anyway, the responses, the culturally patterned responses that some players from Dominican Republic uh, and other Latin American countries were having in response to, for example, successful home runs that were being interpreted within the American media um, as overly ecstatic or overly performative. And so there's kind of this um, pushback against the sense that baseball is changing, uh, but part of that is sort of a commentary on cultural and racial shifts going on within baseball. And so I thought all of that was really interesting, the way in which language um, comes to be itself something that's coded for not just language, but also race, ethnicity, and culture. So all of that to say, kind of my long-winded way of saying, we use language to speak about race, ethnicity, and culture. And sometimes we do that by overtly talking about race or ethnicity, but other times we do that by talking about something else entirely, like quote-unquote language. So there's times where we're talking about race, and we all know that we're talking about race because we use words like race, but there's other times that we're talking about race or ethnicity, but we use other things, like we talk about language and the importance of people learning English, quote-unquote, um, as immigrants to the United States. And what we're, I would argue, really talking about in a lot of cases is not just language as a f functional means of communication. But we're talking more generally about uh, culture, ethnicity, and things of this nature. So let's delve into that a little bit more then. First, language about race and ethnicity. So when we're overtly talking about race and ethnicity, and a good example of how language gets used to talk about race and ethnicity can be found if we compare the 1920 U.S. census versus the 2020 U.S. census. So over time, the number of categories that the U.S. census has for race has dramatically increased. In its very earliest years of asking about race, the U.S. census, uh, as I understand it, basically asked about um, I believe it was black, white, and Indian, <laughs> meaning Native American. And so, but the categories gradually expanded from there. By 1920, you had 20 categories, and those 20, ca or sorry, 10 categories, which were, as you can see in this graphic, um, white, black, quote, mulatto, which of course we'd regard as an offensive terminology now, um, Indian, Chinese, Japanese, Filipino, quote, Hindu, which is actually a religion, not an ethnicity or a race or uh, really strictly speaking, a culture, but is being used essentially um, in, in the census in 1922 as a way of categorizing the large influx of South Asian immigrants at the time, core for Korean, um, and then for all other persons not falling within one of these classes, right? Other. <laughs> so you have 10 different categories, one of which is just a catch-all. Um, the current U.S. census in 2020, you have far more than that. You, you have white and black and they still have this American Indian, quote-unquote, which is very anachronistic nowadays. Um, I find it interesting and perhaps problematic that that's still what's being used there. Um, or Alaska Native. Then we have 
Asian, Indian, Chinese, Filipino, other Asian, and then you can list the nationality, Japanese, Korean, Vietnamese, Native Hawaiian, Guamanian, Samoan, other Pacific Islander, again, you can put some other race. And then not only that, but there's something else you may have noticed, which is that the census over the last 10 years now includes a question for what we call ethnicity. Uh, so it's, you know, is this person of Hispanic, Latino, or Spanish origin? And you can mark no, or you can mark yes, and clarify which specific type of Hispanic, Latino, or Spanish origin. So if you add all that together, you've got uh, kind of like 20 categories, but also if you really think about it, what you have is 75 categories because you have 15 racial categories times five ethnic categories, because someone could, in theory, for example, be um, black and from Puerto Rico, um, or they could be black and Cuban, or they could be black and um, Mexican. So anyways, you take it all together and really there's 75 different ways of identifying somebody on the U.S. Census now. So our ways of talking about race and ethnicity have expanded tremendously over the past 100 years. We expect that they will continue to do so, uh, which I think partly gets at the fact that both race and ethnicity are categories that are socially, to some degree, socially constructed and socially contested and negotiated over time. Groups that at one point are th thought of as distinct ethnicities are later sort of homogenized together in, how, in rac racialized logics, such as how Irish people came over time to be regarded as white within the U.S. when they often were not to begin with. Um, conversely, groups that were once thought of all as sort of one group are later sort of split apart and broken into separate groups. Uh, this represents the same concept. This is from the census. This represents the same concept. They use um, these color-coded boxes and it's not so much the number of boxes, but look at the terms within the boxes, because what they're basically getting at is when it all starts, you basically have slaves and then free people and then free people that are white and then free people that are not white, essentially, is the three categories you had in the 1790 census. But then it gradually you get more and more terms, not so much for white and for black, but you get more and more complicated ways of speaking about um, for example, different types of Native Americans gets a little more complicated, Asian gets far more complicated, and so on and so forth. Um, which makes sense, right? Which makes a lot of sense that we would want greater specificity in this term. Take, for example, Asia, where you have, uh, gosh, approximately one-third or more of the population of the entire world, um, which includes many, many, many different countries with very, very different cultural practices, and yet somehow are being clumped essentially into one or two racial terms um, back in the 1800s. So, interesting stuff. So those are some formal examples of how we speak about race. There are less formal examples as well. And it's really gonna bother me because in this slide I say three less formal examples, but really I only give two. But I'm not gonna fix it. And I know what you're saying, Dunstan, you could fix it right now. If you really wanted to, you could just fix that PowerPoint slide. And I say to you, nay. I refuse to do that. Um, but there are two different examples that I was thinking of, too. Um, one of them is the way in which we speak about people, the European ancestry in the United States. So we've talked before about the term Caucasian and why that's kind of a problematic term because most folks that we call Caucasian have nothing to do with the Caucasus Mountains, among other things. We've also talked about the fact that Caucasian implies a sort of unmarked difference, whereas African American, Native American, Asian American, they all imply that American then has to have some kind of modifier for that group, whereas Caucasian is sometimes treated as sort of this default character char uh, characteristic, right? It's become more common to use a marked term for it, to say something like European American, but that's still pretty uncommon, especially outside of academic circles. Most people identify as Caucasian or white. Um, not only that, but they often identify in very interesting ways. Um, so for many folks of who would self-identify as white, you'll sometimes ask, okay, like, but where are your ancestors from? And I don't know if you've ever heard this, but I've often heard friends uh, who are white say things like, oh, well, you know, I'm from this country and that country. You know, I'm from uh, Germany and France and England and some other ones too. I'm basically just a mutt, quote unquote. Um, so if you've ever heard the term like somebody refer to themselves, and I've heard this several times from several different people, but refer to their European ancestry as I'm a mutt, what they're talking about is I'm from multiple different European countries. But where do we get the term mutt from? We get that term from dogs, right? And okay, but what's the underlying logic there? Dogs have breeds, right? You're, you have purebred dogs and then you have mutts that are like 
mixed of different breeds. So the implication there is sort of that once upon a time, <laughs> back in ye old Europe, there were distinct cultures, distinct ethnicities, but then the, for modern sort of white Americans, those are all just sort of a melting pot, a smudge of everything. And part of the problem, well, problems may be a strong word, but part of the thing that that leads to is it leads to this, or it can lead to this idea of sort of European Americans as lacking distinct cultural backgrounds, when really, in many, many cases, people definitely still carry on the cultural traditions of their ancestors in a variety of different ways. One need only think of um, Russian American traditions, German American traditions, Irish American traditions, but more importantly, it presents a sort of view of culture that doesn't match how anthropologists actually understand culture to work. Um, nobody is just a melting plot, pot, right? We all have distinct influences going on in our life and in our ancestry. So that's just one of the interesting ways in which we speak about ethnicity in everyday conversation. Another example is um, the term Middle Eastern. So I will oftentimes um, draw a picture of the world, which I'm a terrible drawer, but I like do an illustration of the world. And then I talk about, you know, what's the Middle East? And I say, you know, if you were to ask 10 different Americans, you'd probably get, you know, 10 different circles, right? Because Middle East, whatever the actual technical definitions, in everyday American English, it can often be a very, very ambiguous category. Is Pakistan the Middle East or is that Southern Asia? Um, is Egypt the Middle East or is that Northern Africa, right? Like how big or how small? Um, some would say, for example, that Armenia is the Middle East. Is Armenia part of the Middle East? Um, there's all this kind of fuzziness to what counts as the Middle East. And as you talk to people more, what you start to realize is that people, one of the reasons Middle Eastern is kind of a fuzzy, weird category, is that people don't just mean a geographic region. They're talking about culture, and they're also talking about ethnicity and language. So people will also sometimes want to use Middle Eastern as essentially coterminous with Muslim, as essentially synonymous with Muslim majority countries, which of course, if you were to do that, you'd have to count Indonesia. So that doesn't quite work. Um, but nonetheless, that's what people are trying to do sometimes. You also realize that sometimes people are trying to use Middle Eastern as kind of a catch-all for Arabic-speaking or Arabic-majority-speaking nations, which also doesn't quite work because Afghanistan and any number of other nations within the Middle East where that doesn't quite work. Um, I try to use Southwest Asia. I just find it to be a little more precise. But anyways, so Middle Eastern and becomes this kind of catch-all Arab, sometimes becomes this kind of catch-all. Um, there was an anthropological study that was done some time ago, um, a few years after um, the terrible attacks in New York City. But one of the things they were looking at is how sort of New York City school children spoke about race and ethnicity after this horrific, horrific event happening in their community. And one of the things they found, and I mean, school children are not always the most precise in their terminology. Nonetheless, they found that school children oftentimes had very, very blurry categories for speaking about Middle Eastern, quote unquote, and particularly about Arab, quote unquote. And they were oftentimes lumping into that category, for example, Hindu people from India, which really doesn't make sort of any sense at all, right? But also does match the patterns of uh, discrimination um, and violence that were sometimes happening in the wake of these terror attacks. Um, against people from a variety of different southern and southwestern Asian nations. So all of that to say Middle Eastern becomes this extremely fuzzy category for, uh, is that an ethnicity? Is that a language? Is that a culture? People sometimes use it as a racial term. What race is that person? And somebody will say, well, he's Middle Eastern or she's Middle Eastern. What do we actually mean by these terms? They're, they're fuzzy, they're negotiated. And as the example of the school children shows uh, there's something that develops over time, both in an individual's life as they learn how to speak more or less precisely about other people all around them, but also in a nation's life, right? As a culture evolves, they find more and less precise ways to speak about the people around them.